is Morten Rasmussen. I work for ARM. Um, this morning we're going to talk about uh, SCAD deadline and a little bit about SCAD RT. Um, it's sort of a joint session with, with two presenters. Um, well, three. Um, so, is it on? Is it okay? Yeah. Right. Um, so the theme is really how we make use of uh, SCAD deadline for, for real use cases, particularly in the mobile segment where we believe that that uh, SCAD deadline is, is a quite promising solution to, to a range of problems. But um, does this work? It does. We see two overall problems or challenges for using SCAD deadline for real applications. One is the complexity of real applications, and the other one is that systems aren't quite as simple as SCAD deadline currently thinks it is. So in, in the first part, Alessio is going to talk about some real exper experiences using SCAD deadline for, for a real application. And in the latter part, Patrick and I would like to drive a discussion about what we do with, with uh, the challenges of using real hardware for SCAD deadline. Um, so without going further into that, I think we should start the first session with, uh, with Alessio. The network is pretty slow. I'm in the Redis network. <sighs> Crazy. Does it mean load it uh, in the background? Yeah, I see, I see. Uh, but I think now it's it's done. So okay, finally. Uh, so good morning everyone. Uh, thank you Morte for the introduction. Um, in this presentation I will show you a real use case that is uh, the Android Display Pipeline and um, some possible solutions to schedule all the tasks that are involved uh, in this process uh, of showing on the screen what the user or the developer of the application wants. And so let's go straight uh, to the point of uh, what you have, so on your smartphone, uh, you can see uh, basically three different components. On the top, you have a status bar. Uh, on the center, usually you see an application UI when it's not shown uh, as full screen. And on the bottom, you see a navigation bar uh, where uh, no physical buttons are available. And all of these, uh, what have in common is that uh, they uh, are synchronized uh, with a signal that is called vSync for historical reasons. So the vSync is a signal that uh, in the past was used uh, with the old screens to uh, notify when uh, the, the cannon was ready and the screen was ready to start a new frame and this is what happens again. So in order to avoid the so-called screen tearing, uh, where is that? The display is showing uh, the previous frame while we are changing the current frame and then uh, it starts reading the new frame and at that point you have two different frames shown in the screen at the same time. Uh, and this process is called, as I said, uh, screen tearing. The vSync uh, is a signal that is passed uh, to the software to say 
uh, from the screen. Hey, I'm ready to accept a new screen because the old one has been completely shown. Uh, so now uh, we keep the same name, but the meaning is, uh, as I said, is slightly different. So from every application perspective, uh, what an application does uh, in a few points is uh, it reads the data uh, that it receives as an input. Then it prepares uh, a frame, a so-called rasterized frame, and then it commits the frame to another module that is called Surface Flinger. Uh, this happens uh, as in a loop that is activated at every vSync. Surface Flinger is instead a process that uh, lies into the Android framework, and um, again, periodically, what it does is it reads all the inputs from all the applications. So here, for instance, from the status bar, uh, the application UI and navigation bar, and puts them all together in a single frame, and then commits everything everything to to the display uh, and the display controller. So. Um, before going straight to the details of the whole uh, display pipeline, let's discuss how the tasks um, that are involved in this process communicate with each other and synchronize with each other. So um, the process involved in this process uh, basically are uh, waiting for signals. And the sig signals are, most of the time, um, sent through file descriptors, so the signal at the uh, API. And all the data, all the buffers that are shared uh, in this queue for, uh, for elaboration are transferred with buffer queues that are data structures that have different APIs from the producer perspective and the consumer perspective. So uh, what they basically do is that the producer allocates a buffer, I mean, um, reserves a buffer for the production with uh, the queue operation, then it does whatever uh, he wants to do. So it produces the data and fills the buffer with this data, and then queues back the buffer, meaning that, OK, uh, this is ready to be consumed. The consumer uh, instead reserves uh, its buffer that he wants to use, consumes it, and then releases it back for um, that can so that it can be used by the producer. And uh, moreover, since also the GPU is involved in this process and um, it is used by directly, directly by the applications uh, to render the frames, the synchronization between uh, the user space and the application and, uh, and the GPU on the other, on the other side is uh, achieved with synchronization fences uh, that are available in the kernel. So. Uh, this slide is pretty dense. Uh, just don't look at it as a whole. Uh, please follow me, and uh, otherwise it's going to be uh, pretty messy. So just follow me. Everything starts from here, from the vSync signal that actually uh, is triggered by the hardware, by the display controller. Uh, here, for simplicity, it's just behind uh, the tux. And so what happens is that um, this vSync signal is raised and it's cached by the hardware composer. Hardware composer, that is um, a process that runs within Android. So yes, uh, before all of that. Uh, as you can see, uh, the order is from the top to the bottom is the highest level uh, where we have the application. Then we have Android, we have Linux, and the hardware. And from left to right, we have instead the, the timeline. So uh, the newer things that are happening, the older things that are happening. So as I said, uh, the hardware composer receives this uh, vSync uh, signal and uh, forwards it to another thread from the surface flinger process that is called DispSync. Uh, this DispSync has the aim of um, just delaying this signal and broadcast this signal to uh, the other threads involved in this process. So let's start from uh, from the top uh, top line. So we have a thread um, still from the, the this part of the surface flinger process that is called application event thread that com that puts in communication the application and the surface flinger process. And uh, this signal is forwarded to the application uh, UI thread. 
uh, UI thread is a name that is in common uh, among all the uh, all the Android processes and uh, is referred as the main thread of every process. So TID equal to PID uh, for almost all uh, the Android processes. There is an exception that is the system server, but uh, we don't care here in this presentation. So the main thread of the application, what it does is uh, is a loop, and the steps that it um, that it performs are the following. So uh, it receives the input data, then it puts in execution a callback that is called animation, and uh, this callback is provided by the application developer. And the application developer knows that is this callback is going to happen more or less um, periodically, with with a period that is. Uh, 16.6 milliseconds on a screen that has a refresh rate of 60 uh, frames per second. And so after this, uh, this animation callback is executed and the purpose is to uh, update the status of the application or to move the objects and whatever. Um, the next step is that um, the UA thread traverses the whole view tree. And this view tree is a tree with all the uh, objects in the scene. And every time an object changes, then it is invalidated and it invalidates all, the, uh, all, the, all its parents uh, in the tree. So the UI thread traverses all the invalidated objects in the tree. And every time it, it finds something that has changed, uh, it starts producing some so-called redraw, um, redraw instructions. And then that's it. Uh, when, the, when the tree has been traversed, uh, only the, um, only the um, invalidated paths, uh, then it can send uh, the, this redraw list to the render thread, that is another thread within the application. And and that's it. It continues its execution by just um, performing some cleanups of, uh, of the data structures and, uh, and other less critical operations. Uh, render thread instead uh, has aims, so um, traverses these mm, redraw instructions and compresses them. What does it mean? Uh, it tries to find um, some instructions that are useless. For instance, you are trying to redraw an object that is uh, hidden by other objects, and then it's just, uh, and this operation is just removed. Um, so after this compression operation, uh, what happens is that um, um, it translates this operation to GL instructions, asks the buffer queue that is in common between uh, the application and the surface flinger uh, for, for a spot to, uh, to put the results, and then directly asks the, uh, the rendering of its piece of frame uh, to the GPU through um, the DRM um, interface. When the GPU is over, then uh, we have our frame in our in our buffer, and we are ready to post it to the buffer queue. So, the what we have to do. Uh, so at this point, and it continues with uh, with the cleanups. But the new frame for 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 just the uh, rectangle of the application is provided. What happens now? Um, we have to wait for the next vsync trigger. The vsync is triggered, and then uh, we follow another, a different path. So from the application side, everything goes again, as I just mentioned. Um, from the Android uh, perspective instead, we have the Surface Flinger, that whose UI thread is woken up, and it acquires the buffer that was produced by the application. Then it, um, it reserves a buffer from the buffer queue that is shared uh, with, um, with the hardware composer. And then, um, so just before taking the buffer among them, it, it doesn't take 
only the buffer of our application. It takes all the buffers of the different, uh, different applications, so like um, application UI here in this case, and then also the uh, navigation bar and the status bar and all the buffers that are part of the, uh, of the screen. And what it has to do is to compose them in a single frame, and this is obtained uh, with a different piece of hardware. So uh, we request this composition to the hardware composer that forwards the operation to the MDSS that, um, that is another piece of hardware provided um, in, in, in parallel with the GPU, but uh, is, how can I say, um, is mostly two-dimensional operations oriented. So um, MDSS is a name that is Qualcomm specific, but maybe, um, I mean, uh, this is a general term for, for, um, for composition and uh, operations in for, for 2D. Um, why is that? So MDSS that just stands for uh, Multimedia Display Subsystem. And uh, why are not we using directly the GPU? Uh, basically, basically, there are two reasons, and the first reason is that the GPU is not that efficient in doing this kind of operation, so it actually would take longer than, um, than um, an ad hoc, an ad hoc uh, device. And moreover, we have just a single GPU, and we don't want to have contentions or uh, processes that are waiting for the GPU to be, to be free. So once this composition uh, and the whole frame for the display is ready, uh, Surface Flinger is ready to, to post the frame that is going to be uh, shown on the screen at the next VSync when the, s the, the display controller says, yes, I'm ready to accept a new, a new frame. So, um, okay. Let's take, let's make the things now a little bit easier and let's see what are the things that are happening um, inside the pipeline. Um, let's start from, from the top. So first of all, we can see that when the display is showing the frame number N, uh, Surface Flinger is already composing, uh, I mean, putting together and composing uh, the buffers for the frame N plus one that is going to be shown at the next, um, the next VSync event. And while the screen is showing the frame um, number N and the UI thread is working on uh, the frame number N plus two, the application is already uh, starting to work on and generating um, its pieces for the frame N plus two. And this is going to be uh, shown a little bit later. And what else we have to see here? We have to notice that, especially the rendered thread has several sleep times. So it's waiting for other events. Uh, one event is, um, so two of the events are the interaction with the buffer queue, and another event that may be pretty slow is the, is the rendering from, from the GPU. Finally, another thing that we have to notice is that uh, we don't, both the threads here in the, in the application are not time critical from uh, the beginning to the end, but there's a certain point, so when the UI thread uh, gives the ball to, to, to the render thread, uh, he's now doing no more time critical operations, but mm, it's not that critical anymore. Uh, and at this point, when the render thread starts, then it's doing uh, time critical operations, but at a certain point, uh, this doesn't happen anymore. So uh, once the buffer that is produced uh, is sent to the surface flinger, uh, the thread is not critical anymore. Um, in Android, and this is uh, the explanation of the disp sync, uh, on pixel devices, uh, we use a, a trick to to reduce the, the overall latency from uh, for the whole display pipeline that is playing with, with the delays of, of, of the VSync. Uh, so uh, what we do is basically uh, we postpone the uh, VSync event for the application of a little bit, and we also postpone 
the V-sync of the, the surface flinger of a bit more and the result would be that we are able to complete when of course the, the, the workload from the application is not huge we are able to, to complete the whole pipeline in just a single time frame and this reduces a lot the, the total latency. So uh, making the things again a little, so this was a, uh, uh, a bottom-up approach, making the things again uh, much easier. So from the scheduler perspective, uh, we are managing those threads uh, in two different ways. So the application, for obvious reason, uh, is scheduled with CFS and uh, Surface Flinger and uh, the hardware composer threads and uh, all the threads in Surface Flinger are are managed uh, with with FIFO with pretty high priorities. So, what we would like to have for what we would like to expect. Uh, for a display pipeline is that we want it to be low latency as much as we can so uh, since Android is also used for um, There are many gaming applications running on Android. Uh, we don't want the, the system to show to the screen uh, The results of an action after too long and we want we want it to be as reactive and interactive as we can um, Yes. Yes. Um, uh, there's another process involved in the in catching the input, but actually it arrives to to, to the application after after the, the VC. Uh, that, that is also that, that is also yes uh, that is also device dependent but th the problem is also that um, you see the result o on smartphones uh, one of the p few outputs you have uh, are multimedia outputs so you can either get the output from the display and you see the result from the display or the from the audio interface so uh, y y <sighs> there is not just a pin that you can raise and you get the result to, to measure the real latency well you could uh, but something like that is usually performed with the with the audio interface and that is much easier to be to be catched uh, When we enter the render thread, mm -hmm. is that thread actually executing callbacks defined by the application developers? And so the variability in terms of workload is actually directly linked uh, with code developed uh, by the application developer, or is just like processing data that has been prepared by executing callbacks? So as far as I know, uh, the application developer has no freedom to change to what, what, what the render thread does directly but of course um, what the render thread does is the result of uh, all the redraw list and these redraw lists uh, depends on what happened on the application so, uh, so in principle it's, uh, it's possible to estimate let's say uh, what's the amount of work that the render thread is going to execute because it's just processing data that has been already collected is this a uh, redraw list and yes. can get an Probably the estimation of how long it would take. Okay. Um. You'd, have to analyze, you'd, have to, you'd have to analyze the buffer that's being passed in order to do right. that, which obviously takes time and has to have be True. another thread that's scheduled to yeah. analyze it. Yeah, but at least we are not bounded to. You're not bounded. Pull yeah. back and another pull thing too is that the render thread is is uh, created by the framework, so it's it's. In some sense, owned by the framework, but it's a thread in the context of the app. So that <coughs> API is well defined and can't be changed by the application. So the UI thread, that's completely user, that's completely user code. The render thread is partially framework, but it does call back to user code to actually um, execute. It calls back to user code. Um, well, it, so user code is executed in that context to kick off the different graphics commands that have to be kicked off to build the to build the command list that passed the GPU. You can see that as a library. 
So right. generally, you think of the, the UI thread is updating the state of the, of the application. The render thread is taking that state and turning it into GPU commands to execute and then submitting yeah. it to the GPU. Yeah, I was under the impression that the UI thread was actually for the application code, and the render thread was just processing information already generated by the UI thread without any more, let's say, direct interaction with user code. So it is user code. Does the application developer know how much time uh, it takes uh, for actually doing user recomposition? They don't know. Yeah, they don't really have a good notion of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and that's because it's somewhat opaque and also because most application developers are just have no clue. So but is there a way to, to switch to the uh, higher latency way of processing this thing? I mean, because, I mean using the, the trick that you show, then you're basically reducing latency, so what, but then... So, it'll, it, so the system itself will stay single buffering as long as you can, mm -hmm. but if you miss, you fall into double okay, buffering so there is a full until bit. there's a gap where we can catch okay. up and okay. get back to That's the That's all happening basically yeah, that, the, the, the developer has no control of that other than just being slow. Okay. Okay. And, <coughs> yeah, and also I don't know how easy it would be um, to estimate the cost for, for each redraw, redraw item. Um, and it also depends on, on, on the GPU and the operation that the GPU has to, be, has, has to do and also the, the, the frequency of the GPU that is something that is uh, not that under our control. And not only the application accessing the GPU, probably because it's not uh, Yeah, in this... Things in that case are a little bit more tricky, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not part of the presentation. Like if you have a split screen, so you have two apps, yeah. you basically double the, the, the second pipeline to do the exact same stuff. Yeah. And obviously, there are you know, they're arbitrating for GQ. <laughs> yeah, I think what Patrick was saying is that uh, you have contention between <coughs> two different applications in the use of the GPU, and right. this is. <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, going ahead with the presentation, uh, yeah, I was saying we don't want to, to, to drop frames. So we want the screen to be low latency, but at the same time, we want it to be uh, as smooth as we can. So we want to provide um, the same frequency rate as, uh, as the screen refresh rate. So basically, most of the applications, it's uh, a stable 50, uh, 60 frames per second. And finally, another very strict requirement is that we want it to be uh, a low energy since um, most of Android applications are mobile applications, mobile devices, sorry. And uh, you would say, yes, um, I'm the owner of a Pixel 3 device or uh, whatever Pixel device. And um, either if I'm using CFS to schedule my uh, application threads, uh, it's pretty. It's working pretty well. So the latency is pretty slow, and um, and I, I cannot see any frames dropped. It's very smooth and whatever. So uh, behind the scene, we have a little trick that is used to 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 get rid of the lags from um, from from the kernel side. From uh, this is a big sentence, but I mean, um, since there, a, there is no mechanism yet to, to manage properly all the interactions among the threads, uh, we have this little trick that, is, um, that catches when the user is interacting with the device. So basically, when the user touches the screen or, or does some, um, some other interactions. And um, when it notices that user is doing something, then we are capping the minimum frequencies that we can reach. So uh, this, na the, this item is, um, is called touch boost in this trick. And so that um, when, um, when Shadutil or whatever governor uh, detects that maybe we can um, decrease the frequency to, to be more efficient, uh, it finds this boundary and it cannot go below this boundary. And this, of course, makes uh, the things much better. But we don't like it because we are setting um, 
a lower limit that is maybe not that efficient and at that point is not that required. Maybe um, the application is the application load is pretty slow and we don't need that high frequency to run that. So um, let's go directly to uh, what can be uh, some of the solutions and the drawbacks of these solutions is managing the display pipeline. So this is what happens basically with, uh, with the standard CFS approach. So let's start from the left. Uh, we see that we have, uh, these are just rough numbers that uh, for, for the sake of presentation. So we see that the, the UI thread has an utilization of 0.2 and okay. We see that the render thread uh, has an utilization of 0.5. These are numbers that uh, that are catched by um, by all the heuristics uh, that are in the kernel, and yeah, we see. Uh, so the utilization in one run queue is probably 0.5. The utilization in another run queue is 0.2. Uh, then uh, in my frequency island, uh, I can set. 0.5 and use the OPP that is in the middle. So I cut the frequency in a half and it looks fair. The problem is that we are making the UI thread a little longer. So we are postponing the activation of the render thread and we are making also the render thread a bit longer. Uh, and the result is that uh, we miss the, 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 the next vsync. And the user is not happy because probably we are dropping a frame or we are keeping the same frame as uh, the previous vsync. And the penguin is not happy. So we can change uh, this mechanism by, uh, by adding util clamp that uh, is currently under discussion in the mailing list. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for that. And so. The basic idea behi behind uh, util clamp is to provide hard margins on the utilization. So it's like like hinting hinting the kernel that um, we want to stay in a given range of utilization, so that uh, the the power governor already knows uh, that it cannot go beyond these uh, these margins. So we can set um, this works both for single threads and for uh, groups of threads and we can put both the, 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 the threads of our application uh, inside a single uh, group that is using util clamp and we can since there, there is some overlapping between tasks we, we, we can decide to uh, to set an utilization that is in the middle so uh, let's put it instead of the sum that would be very conservative let's put uh, 0.6 so there is a user with appropriate permissions that decides to clamp the utilization of, the, of our group. And either if our utilization measured utilization would be 0.5, we are clamping the minimum value to 0.6 and decreasing the, the frequency accordingly to the, to the right OPP. The result can be, can be pretty, pr pretty good. What are the, bro the drawbacks of using C CFS? So the good things are that um, the, UP, uh, the OPPs are, uh, are chosen uh, by using the notion of utilization. And it works well with, um, on the energy side. And it also provides a very good load distribution among, among processes that and threads that are running uh, within the same scheduling class. Uh, what we don't like is that it's, so since those applications are, um, uh, the, the application threads are very important from, from the user perspective to, for the user experience, uh, then they shouldn't find, uh, they shouldn't fight against um, other services that are, for instance, background services that are running in the same um, scheduling class. And we also would like our, our application threads to be, to be run as soon as we, as we can, so uh, to decrease the scheduling latency. And uh, there is no notion of deadline. And these are all things that CFS doesn't take care of by, by, by definition. Yes, yes. 
software can use, or is that something that happens inside Android? Uh, no, it's not yet happening. Because I've seen some Java, I guess, it was oh. on the slides. I'm no, 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 it's a double colon. It's not the Java code that you were showing. It's in the previous slide, there was this double colon. Yeah, this API double uh, okay. no, no, no. colon. This is, uh, I don't know if it was Java, so that's why uh, I'm asking. No, it's not Java. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, util clamp is, um, is an extension for, for the kernel. And uh, yeah. Moment you drive it from from the yes, so from within Android. Yeah. Why yeah, we need. Why can the schedule statistic rather than changing a computer's consumption of it? Sorry, say it again. Why change? Why pen the schedule statistic rather than changing the computer's consumption of it? So you mean like changing the device tree? No, no, ch changing your frequency pickup to interpret utilization differently, right? Why, why, pin you, why pin the signal into it versus changing how it consumes the signal? That's, uh, yeah. that's what we actually do in that. I mean, we, we bias the decision of the frequency selector by featuring the but no, 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 but you're changing the schedulers out. Like, why change what the scheduler is doing? It's not, it's not changing the scheduler, it's featuring what the scheduler sees. So it's not really changing the utilization at all. The utilization signal is unchanged. When we enter Shadugil, we put a glass on top of Shadugil and say, okay, it looks the signal better that way. We are treating yeah, the power governor. The shaders tasks are not touched at all. They home. only do it for the interesting uh, group of tasks, not for, for everybody. So, but, so this isn't changing any to average? No. And, uh, and uh, kind of related to that one, there is uh, a per task API, so potentially it's possible to expose that API to the users. I don't think it would be really usable, but if you want to have like special cases where you want, uh, for example, it can be exposed for degradation, right? So if you have a, uh, an application called as a task, which is usually very big, but it's not very important, you can expose something and say, okay, run it on a lower frequency and be more energy efficient. Yeah, I was so thinking to dynamic workloads where instead yeah, of waiting for the system to, yeah. I mean, as in the paper we did, uh, instead of waiting for the system to automatically figure out your, your workload is increasing, you can tell from the application side, you can tell it ahead of time, hey, look, I'm going to do times 1.2 and whatever it was till now, and it will apply something all the way down to the kernel. But you can close a control loop, but it will be still in user space, but within the runtime of Android, not exposed to yeah. so maybe you can you can provide hints from the application, but uh, maybe not directly access in the API of you. Yeah, yeah, of course. That, that was, so you could aggregate, you know, all the yes, hints from yes. all the apps. Yeah. No, otherwise, uh, all the developers would set a, yes. a minimum clamp into to, to one. <laughs> and okay, so uh, in, in case it isn't obvious there that. Some of the worst cases are there's like a simple app that we use in testing that's just all it is is a ball bouncing around the screen. So UI thread, all it's doing is updating the position. Render thread is just moving the ball slightly. It's the lightest load you can possibly do. But if you run that on most Android phones, it's just janky as hell. It's, it, it, it's, it should be nice and smooth and bounce off the walls, but it's just totally jerky and and, and, uh, and that's because the, the frequency selection is based on load. And this is a super light thing. But because the, we're setting the min frequency, because of the load, it, it doesn't make the frames. And so it's missing frames just all over the place. And so this is a, one of, kind of one of our key test apps now in, in for, for Pixel devices. And so Pixel gets it nice and smooth, but it's doing it by using some of these tricks of, of yeah. artificially okay. inflating. As also I understand, probably when the user interacts, you are touching the screen, so you are boosting. So then you boost. So then you boost. But if you don't touch, yeah, and but if you don't have a touch, if you don't have something that's own, causing then, yeah, us then. To, to, you know, raise the clocks, <laughs> and, and and just sort of arbitrarily raising the clocks is costing a lot of power because most most of the applications don't require that level of boosting. So one of the things that that is promising about Deadline is it lets us be a bit more precise and not just sort of use this kind of ham-handed raise the clock yeah, and touch sure. the phone for as long as like three seconds or five seconds. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, this is what uh, is probably <coughs> happening with, um, with, with our ball that is bouncing, that we are going to an OPP that is so low that it's making the whole pipeline explode. 
just to clarify, you know, on pixel devices, the touch boost defines the start of the frequency increase. The hand is defined by monitoring some part of specific device. No, which it's, which it's, time, it's time based. So if you touch that, it yeah. and you don't touch it again, it's going to just be a time expiration. That, that but if you touch it again during that period, <laughs> it, it isn't going to add the same amount, but it's, it's doing some, it, it is going to increase it by some amount. So, so if you keep, you know, if you keep touching it, then it's going to be so high. Yeah. Yeah, you have a, uh, a limited boosting yeah. window. <laughs> um, so, okay. Okay, so uh, going back to, to, to uh, going back on track. Um, and so to recap, so that <laughs> we can connect to, um, what we are missing from, from CFS is that um, since our threads are very important, uh, we, we don't want them to, to compete against, um, against other, other background, background services that are still running on under CFS. And we want to have a low latency so to, to be scheduled as soon as we can. And we would like to have the notion of deadline since the period uh, that is given by the, um, uh, by the f refresh rate of the screen is given, is well known, and we know that we want to finish to, uh, to produce our frame before the next VSync. So we can think of going up in our um, scheduler, scheduler classes uh, list, and we find RT. And yeah, it sounds good because first of all, uh, we, we, we are introducing the notion of real time and we have a better latency, of course, because we are not competing against uh, CFS tasks and we have fixed priorities. So we already know uh, what, are, wh what can be our, um, our preemptors. The, problem is th the problems are that um, we our applications are very important, but we don't want them to give, we don't want to give them so much power that they can start our, our system processes. And so we can think of adding the boundaries, so like uh, a bandwidth boundary, and to throttle them when they are overutilizing uh, the, 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 the CPU. But we don't want them to be to be throttled with a so hard, so harsh mechanism, uh, because because they are still important. So we don't want to cut their th their execution in a su in such a rude way. Maybe the motion could be a solution. This could be a ballot for discussion. And uh, moreover, as I was mentioning before, our tasks are not critical all the time. So they are critical only at the beginning and then when, 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 they, um, when they give away their results are, are not critical anymore. So uh, why do we want them to preempt uh, CFS threads um, for, for doing non-critical, uh, non-time critical operations? And again, uh, there's no notion of deadline here. So we are just mm, high priority, but we don't know when uh, we are going to expire, uh, when we really want to produce our results. Regarding the energy, um, the mainline solution is that uh, when we have RT tasks running, uh, we have to, to, to send the, OPP, uh, the, the, the CPU to the maximum OPP. And this was, of course, what? Didn't I have 50 minutes? <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, so the problem is that, um, uh, fortunately, so on mobile devices, we cannot uh, achieve that and, uh, for, for energy reasons. So uh, we are still using UTLS, uh, sorry, uh, shed util to, to, to modulate the frequencies uh, in, in um, also for the RT classes, uh, at class. And um, okay, this could be something that also mainline may, may benefit of. Um, we can think of using SCAD deadline uh, as it is. So by scheduling deadline uh, as a deadline, both of the, of the 
tasks uh, in our application. But the problem is that, uh, yeah, we are high priority. We now have the notion of deadline finally, and we have bandwidth constraints. So we can we, we can set the bandwidth uh, in such a way that we are not starving uh, all the remaining of the system. And uh, thanks to the the latest patches from uh, Yuri, Luca, and Daniel, and uh, everybody who contributed, now we also have uh, Grab PA that changes the frequency according to the deadline bandwidth, and this is also good for, for the energy. The problem is that we still have a, um, a throttling mechanism that is very aggressive, and uh, SCAD deadline, unfortunately, doesn't work well with suspensions, so if you go to sleep and then wake up, you may risk not to be uh, scheduled. Uh, instead, if you were running uh, just uh, without interruption, you could. Um, it doesn't work well with inheritance, so uh, priority inheritance with RT is uh, quite easy to, to manage. With deadline, it's not easy at all. So do you want to inherit deadline? Do you want to inherit the bandwidth? Do you want to inherit um, whatever? It's not easy, both from the uh, theoretical and practical perspective. And uh, it's conservative, so you need a lot of bandwidth to to schedule the, the whole system. And our tasks, again, are not critical from the beginning to the end. Uh, maybe we can think of extending the deadline mechanism by using the proxy execution. So uh, you have like uh, a token that uh, is the deadline entity that is passed among different threads um, when they finish their critical time critical section, so they start time critical, and they were when they are no more time critical, they send this uh, th this token to another thread, and when it's over, it goes back to the previous one. Uh, this is an approach that makes sense in a situation like this, where uh, the time critical path is always sequential. There's no parallel um, interaction. And maybe we can think of having a scheduling manager in the Android framework, which, um, which adjusts the deadline parameters in such a way that uh, we reserve the, the appropriate amount of bandwidth for, for our tasks, for our uh, tasks involved in the chain. Um, it's also so the good things are uh, all the things that, that are good for deadline, and it's a bit less conservative that, since it's just like having a single deadline task that is running. The problem is that uh, throttling is still quite aggressive, suspensions are still an issue, and inheritance is still an issue. That's kind of right. But if you are suspending, when you are uh, when you have the token, then the problem is still is still there. So I mean, you are not th the problem is not inheritance among tasks in the chain in the same chain, but uh, it's not suspending waiting for another task. It's maybe suspending it in the end waiting for the GPU, for example. Yeah, then you're, task. Then you're suspending. The and of course, we have all the other data issues that are like. Uh, the problem with the affinity and uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, for the suspension, know. there's a patch, right? There's a there's a sound way of fixing the problem. You, you oh, can handle self-suspending uh, ah. CBS servers. Yeah, so, so we can shrink the runtime. Uh, is it something that does something like that? Okay. We yeah, can you can keep when you wake up. You can preserve the old deadline if you want. You can shrink the runtime. Oh. Of course, there oh, are yeah. of course we have back to, to that as well. But the, the good thing would be to continue to execute and but keeping the same deadline, not to, to wait to, to the next. <coughs> uh, so, yeah, this is something that uh, is coming out uh, again. So we can also think of, um, I, I, I send you back to the slides that uh, were presented by Luca the last year, maybe, uh, two years ago. Uh, regarding the hierarchical, yeah, it was a long time ago. So regarding the hierarchical scheduling, so the basic idea would be to have uh, R RT tasks that are scheduled under a deadline entity. So um, the good thi thing is that um, in this case, it's 
theoretically simpler to, to perform a schedula schedulability analysis of our task set. And we also uh, are in enhancing our bandwidth constraints for, for RT with another parameter that is the deadline. We also have a group of tasks sharing the same deadline. That is something that is currently missing from uh, the, the, the available implementation. We have uh, the OPP selection driven by, mm, by uh, the, the, the bandwidth of deadline. That is something that is good. And uh, it would be a huge code cleanup since uh, we can run both of the RT and CFS bandwidth enforcement mechanisms uh, below the mechanism provided by deadline. This doesn't come for, for free, so again, we have the problems that deadline has, like affinities and bandwidth pessimism, and we are increasing, we are adding another layer of scheduling, so we are increasing the latency, and we have a lot of migration, so um, for the patch that has been posted to the list a lot, long time ago, and I'm not that proud of it, um, the unfortunately, we have to migrate our tasks among different CPUs uh, to to be theoretically sound. Um, I don't want to get into the, the details because the time is uh, is almost over. And okay, so fortunately, this was my last slide. Uh, uh, okay, so. Proxy execution, Yuri is going to present something tomorrow. Uh, I saw that on the program, so <laughs> he is going to, to talk about it. And um, another problem of throttling is that, yeah, we are saying that throttling is too aggressive, but uh, if instead of, so um, if we use the bandwidth as a way of selecting the frequency, then we are, uh, at the time we are going to miss our deadline, it's gonna be too late because we are, by decreasing the frequency, we are making our task longer. So when we notice that something is going wrong, it will be already too late to, to recover. And another thing is that, uh, something that I already mentioned the last year, and it's something I'm working on, but uh, I'm always preemptive and, preemptive and I, I didn't post it yet, is some way of, tel of measuring the real time or uh, execution time of our task. So the problem is that if you want to monitor uh, from the user's perspective how much time you executed, then uh, usually end up in using, I don't know, uh, clock monotonic or clock process CPU time ID or thread ID. And these are not uh, taking care of the current CPU mm, uh, frequency and CPU capacity. So you don't have a real measurement of what's going on. And then how, and there is also no way of knowing the frequency switches and do you really want to do that? Do so, that yeah. So that's exactly what I was trying to do. So the PEL time is already um, CPU frequency and capacity invariant. So I would like to expose these new clocks uh, to the user space so that one can simply um, run a clock at time and get the results of, of that. Uh, this is another API that I think it would be nice to be done. So unfortunately, there's no room for discussion. Uh, we can discuss it later at lunchtime. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Yes. So I will reclaim <laughs> your, your bandwidth. Oh, yes. This is something that would be nice. Or maybe if we don't want to demote directly to CFS, uh, there can be another class. This is something I think that was proposed by Daniel a long time ago like going after CFS when there is no more CFS task? Hmm? Yeah, okay, so.